So, good morning once again. <sighs> well, you know, I um, always get asked after this what the name of the message is. And today I actually have a name. <laughs> Today's message is Jesus Christ, my past, my present, my future. Amen, that's good. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Let's open in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just come before you once again with our hearts open and our ears ready to hear everything that you have for us. Thank you, Father. It's no accident that we're here this morning. Thank you, Father. You have a message for us because you love us. Father, I thank you that hearts are expectant and ready to receive. And then I'm ready, Father, to give this message in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Well, let's... I should have gotten some of these notes to Bud. So if you want to open up to um, Romans 5.17, Bud, that would be great. Back here on the monitors. For if, because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. They have it up here. Much more, those who receive the abundance of grace. Abundance, and that word in the Greek doesn't just mean abundance. That word means super abundance. <laughs> super abundance, it means being more than is sufficient or required. It's extravagant abundance. That's what Jesus says we have, abundance. The abundance of his grace. And grace is the divine influence upon the heart and its reflection in the life. It, uh, grace also means that which affords joy, pleasure, delight, sweetness, charm, and loveliness. Grace is goodwill, loving kindness, favor. Grace is the merciful God. So we who believe in Jesus Christ have received the abundance, the super abundance of the mercy of God, the super abundance of his influence on your heart, the super abundance of his loveliness, his goodness, his loving kindness for you. Wow. That's what we have in Christ. And beyond that, we receive the, soup, the abundance of grace and the gift, the free gift of righteousness. Now, what does the word gift mean? In the Greek, gift means gift. <laughs> Hallelujah. It means exactly what it says. It's a gift. It requires no payment from you because it's been paid in full. Just like Arthur talked about last week, if, you, if someone comes along and pays your mortgage, hallelujah, hallelujah <laughs> then you're not required to make a payment next month because right. it's paid in full. In fact, if you try to pay the bank again, they're going to send the check back to you and say, yeah. what are you doing? Yeah. And that's what God says to us, too. It's a gift. Your salvation is a gift. If you come to God and you say, here, God, I'm trying to pay you back, he's going to throw the check back at you. Because this is a payment that we couldn't make. And salvation isn't made on the installment plan. Hallelujah. Uh, yeah. Salvation has been paid in full by Jesus Christ. And your righteousness 
is a free gift from God. God, the creator, the almighty, has declared you righteous because of your faith in his son, Jesus. And you are not mighty enough to undo God's declaration. When God declares someone righteous, who are we to say they're unrighteous? Don't say that about yourself. Because what God has made clean, we cannot declare unclean. That's why Peter had that vision. It wasn't about food, although that's great. Because... We have bacon now. But the point was God had declared the Gentiles clean. And Peter was told, you don't, uh, don't declare something unclean when I've made it clean. And God has made you clean. He has purified your heart. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So that was free from God. I didn't have that in my notes at all. Hallelujah. You know, what we've received from God in salvation is glorious. But for too long, all we've done is look to the future. For too long, salvation has just been pie in the sky when we die. You know? And if salvation... It's just something we receive after death. What good is it? I have to live now. And what kind of father would God be if he didn't provide for the now? And he has. He's provided for the now because he's a good, good father. He is so good. He's provided for the now. He's provided for the future. But I tell you what, he also took care of your past. Yeah, he did. He did. He took care of your past. Uh It's a good thing. It is a good thing because not many people in the church seem to know that. Not many people know what Jesus did about our past. See, we all know what happened to Jesus on the cross. But not enough Christians understand what happened to them at the cross. What happened to you at the cross? What happened to you? You died. You died with him. That's what happened. 2,000 years ago, your past began at the cross. My testimony, I was born, I did some stuff, I died with Christ, I rose again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But I want to tell you exactly what happened to you on the cross. Because if we don't understand what happened to us at the cross, we're never going to fulfill and walk in this abundance of grace if we don't understand what happened to us. And there are three questions we're going to look at today about what happened to the cross. What did you lose at the cross? What did you gain at the cross? And what did you retain at the cross? So that's what we're going to look at. I'll try and watch the clock. Hallelujah. I'm notorious for going short, but I don't know that I will today. Hallelujah. So, so, Romans 6, 6 through 7. What did you lose at the cross? We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing 
so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Hallelujah. What did you lose at the cross? You lost the old man. You lost the sin nature. There, there is a teaching out there, man, probably 20, 30 years ago, that, that the old man and the new man existed in you at the same time. <sighs> that is such a lie. Because our old self was crucified with Jesus. The old man is dead. And you cannot resurrect him, and you cannot reform him. What should you do with the old man? You should dance on his exactly. grave. Right. Dance on his grave. He is yeah. dead, yeah. and he is not coming back. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. And with him, look at that. Look at this says. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Uh, Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. you have been set free from sin. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Hallelujah. What does that mean? What does that mean? Because you know what? Can I fill you in on a dirty little secret? <clears throat> we still sin. What is that? We still do wrong things. Yeah. But I tell you truthfully, it's not in your nature. It's not in your nature. The old nature is dead. You are a new man, a new creature in Christ Jesus. Yeah. And in Hebrews it says, you are perfect. How can I say that? Because... You have become one spirit with the spirit of God. And God gladly did this. God gladly made you one spirit with his because he knew that sin could not taint him. In fact, he gave us his Holy Spirit to dwell in us forever. We are wall-to-wall -wall Holy Ghost. We are one with God in spirit. And it says that the spirit is our guarantee that the spirit seals us. It's a, it's a seal, you know, in... in in olden times, you would have sealed it with wax, you know, and, and then, then that kept all the good stuff in, kept all the bad stuff out. And the Holy Spirit has sealed your spirit. So even though we walk in this earth and we do stuff, it cannot touch your spirit. Thank you, Lord. That is so it cannot make you impure because you have been born of uncorruptible seed. Yeah, thank you. Uncorruptible. Yeah. That's you. Oh, good. <sighs> Hallelujah. That's what we received. The uncorruptible seed. Now you know what else is gone? All your sin. Jesus took that sin and he removed it as far from you as the east is from the west. That's and right. you will never see it again. God does not remember it anymore. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He promised in Isaiah not to remember it anymore. And in Psalm 103, verses 10 through 12, David prophesied what was coming. And it says here, and this is what we live in, God does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. 
For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who, who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Oh, awesome. Thank you. Thank wow. you, Jesus. Sin had a death grip on mankind, but Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. And that broke, that grip was broken. We're no longer a slave to sin. So, before we were saved, we had a natural inability to please God. Before we were saved, we couldn't do it. There was nothing we could do that would please him. But, and it says in Romans 8.8, 8, it says those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But we lost that natural ability at the cross. And now God is holy and completely pleased with you because of what Jesus Christ did. Right. Because you put your trust in Jesus, God is pleased with you and he will never be angry with you. So. And here's something that many people in the church do not know. At the cross, we lost our relationship with the law of Moses. Does that surprise? That might surprise some of you because a lot of churches still hang on to the law of Moses as though that's our means to righteousness. But righteousness is a free gift. At the cross, when Jesus Christ said, it is finished, what was finished? The fulfillment of the law. He fulfilled it, so you don't have to. Hallelujah. In Romans 7, 4 through 6, it says, Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ, that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that you may bear fruit for God. For while we were living in the flesh, before Christ, before salvation, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law having died to that which held us captive so that we can serve in the new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the written code. We have a new law in our life now. It's love. Yes. Love is the new law. And if we are loving our neighbors, you're not going to lie about them. You're not going to steal from them. You're not going to murder them. You're not going to covet what they have. The law of love rules your heart. And it's so far greater than 10 rules written on stone that were given to condemn you. The law actually increased sin. It did. Because if we didn't know that there was a law, see, people are this. This is the way people are. When I tell you not to do something, mm -mm -mm, that's exactly what you want to do. Mm -hmm. I remember Andrew Wellmack tells the story about a birthday party he had for his son. And he wanted to test out this theory. So in the backyard, his wife had these beautiful roses. And he said to the kids, you guys go ahead, have fun, play, have a great time. But whatever you do, nobody spit on these roses. Yeah, there you go. Mm -hmm. Nobody spit on those roses. And then he went inside to watch. <laughs> He said every single one of them, even his own son, spit on those roses. Now, do you think kids are thinking about spitting on roses? No. What made them spit on the roses? The law that was given. 
And that is how law increased sin. Because if we didn't know it was a sin, we wouldn't think about it, and we wouldn't be tempted by it. And we had no ability to fight against sin. But we do now. We do now. Those are the things that we lost at the cross. So, what else did we lose? We lost rejection. We lost rejection. We became accepted in the beloved. We became accepted in Christ. We became the children of God. You are God's child. You are a co-heir with Christ. God is not looking. God has no fly swatter. You know, he's not looking at you to beat you down. God has only good plans for your life. He has a good end plan for your life. He's not looking to condemn you at all. So, so God loves us. You are accepted. You are loved. 1 John 4, 15 through 19 says this. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God. Any of you confess that? Yes. Yes. Jesus is the Son of God. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him. And he in God. Hallelujah. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. And by this is love perfected with us. By what? By knowing that he loves us. By this is love perfected in us, knowing that he loves us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he, Jesus, is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved See, there's no fear when you know that God loves you perfectly. You don't have to fear God's judgment. God is not going to judge you because God has already judged you. And God judged you innocent. Don't fear that word judgment. In every law case, there's a judgment. Sometimes the judge says guilty. Sometimes the judge says not guilty. In the case of the believer, God has declared us not guilty. And beyond that, he's declared us innocent. There is no evidence against you, you innocent people. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. You lost your old identity. And you lost the source of your security, that old source of security. Whatever it was that made you secure in the past, whether it was your job or it was a relationship or it was money, (coughs) all of those things no longer are the source of security for you. Your source of security is now God himself. Hallelujah. Galatians 6.14 says... But far be it from me to boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me, and I to the world. I'm dead to the world. The world system has no control over me. I am living in the kingdom of God. That is my now, that is my present, that is my future. That is your future. That is your present. So, what did you gain at the cross? Man, I gotta get moving in. 
What did you gain at the cross? We've talked about it. You gained complete forgiveness. Complete forgiveness for your past sins, your present sin, your future sins. That was all forgiven. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. Therefore, peace comes with God. Complete forgiveness. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 9. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. God was reconciling the world to himself. Do you know from God's point of view, the entire world has been reconciled to himself? That's not just talking about believers. That's talking about unbelievers too. God does not view mankind as an enemy. And never did. And never did. Now we, in our own mind, felt ourselves separated from God. But God never separated himself from us. So when we look at an unbeliever, we should see them the way God sees them. That is, someone who God has reconciled to himself. And that's why we've been given the ministry of reconciliation so that we say, come, be reconciled with God. God's done his part. Come, be reconciled with him. He's forgiven your sins. He wants to have a relationship with you. He loves you. He's not condemning you. God is not condemning. He's not counting your trespasses against you. God is not counting the trespasses of sin against the world. You don't hear that in many churches. But it's, the, it's not me saying that. It's what I'm reading right here from the Word. It says that God has reconciled the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. God is not keeping track of sin because he took care of that problem. There is nothing that separates any person from God if they will just come. If they will just come. Hallelujah. Colossians 2, 13 through 14 says, Colossians 2, 13 and 14, And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, and that was us, we were dead. And we were dead. You know, it's not just, you know, Jesus came and he resurrected us. We were dead. We were dead in our trespasses. But God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, and that's the ordinances that were nailed, that were written in stone, is how the King James writes it. Which ordinances were written in stone? The Ten Commandments. Those were the records that stood against us, and they had legal demands. The demand was death. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. The ordinances against us, the evidence against us was nailed to the cross and God made us alive together with him. In Colossians 2, 13 through 14, in the Passion Translation, 
I wanted to read it out of the Passion Translation, too. So it says, this realm of death describes our former state, for we were held in sin's grasp, but now we've been resurrected out of that realm of death, never to return, for we are forever alive and forever forgiven of all our sins. He canceled out every legal violation we had on our record and the old arrest warrant that stood to indict us. He erased it all, our sins, our stained soul. He deleted it all and they cannot be retrieved. Everything we once were in Adam has been placed unto his cross and nailed permanently there as a public display of cancellation. Hallelujah. The old man is dead. The old man is dead. Dead is dead. We gained his acceptance. We gain his righteousness. We gain his perfection. Hebrews 10, 14 says, for by one offering, and that's the offering that Jesus gave, he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. He hath perfected forever. Now, if you grew up in a denomination that taught you that when you sin, you have to get saved and sin and saved and sin and saved, well, I tell you what, that doesn't jive with this verse that says that we've been perfected forever. It doesn't seem forever if it ends and has to start again and ends and has to start again. And eternal life isn't very eternal if it ends and has to start again and ends and has to start again. <laughs> God did a better job than that. Oh, yes, he, did. he perfected you. Now, you may have, find it hard to believe that God says you're perfect, but he does. God is completely satisfied with you. Now, your spouse might not be. <laughs> Your kids might not be, but God is completely satisfied with you. Wow, thank you. Completely. Hallelujah. That is so good. Yes. Hallelujah. The Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of God, dwells in you. That's what we received. We received his spirit. And I tell you what, it's his spirit that makes this whole life possible. Because his spirit teaches us. His spirit comforts us. His spirit guides us. His spirit quickens our flesh. And his spirit has, it's been promised. Jesus said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. This is not like the Old Testament, where the spirit came and left and came and left. No, the spirit of God indwells the believer. And that is a permanent home. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. He lives in you. He, he not only lives in you, and I, you know, sometimes people talk, well, they give God this little corner. No, he indwells you. He is making his home in you. And as you cooperate with him, man, he broadens his presence in your life to the degree that it begins to spill out. Bring it on. 
it begins to bear fruit. It's the spirit that bears fruit in your life. His love, his joy, his long-suffering, his patience, his gentleness, his goodness, his faith, those things pour out of you because the Holy Spirit dwells in you. Hallelujah. Man, we, re- we, we received the thoughts of his mind. Hallelujah. In 1 Corinthians 2, 16, it says, For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of God. Hallelujah. You know, that, that leads into what to re- retain. You know, when you were saved, we retain basically two things. We retain this body. (laughs) You know, that's okay. It's okay. We retain this body, and we look forward to the redemption of this body. But for now, this flesh is still subject to the, the world, you know. Our bones still can break and germs can still affect us. But you know what? Jesus has come and he has provided a way for us to receive health and healing in our bodies. That's right, in our bodies. Hallelujah. God took care of that. So, But you know what? We still have our personalities. You know, if you were a bad driver before you came to Christ, you're probably still a bad driver. You know? So, I mean, there are things that are the same. And we retain our mind. I mean, God didn't just give us a complete mind washing. See, because we still have our old memories. We still remember how the old man functioned. And sometimes we still let him influence us. But you know what? That's not who we are. And we can, through the knowledge of Christ, grow and the mind of God can function. And as we learn more of the word and more of his grace and come to know who Jesus is and what the true nature of God is, we find that we're becoming more like him. Because God's purpose is for us to become filled with the fullness of God. And that comes through our knowledge of Jesus Christ comes through our knowledge of his love for us. So this is a work in progress. We are a work in progress, but you know what? Who works beside us? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit works with us and he teaches us. And it will slow down a bit and listen. He'll tell us exactly who we are in Christ. And more and more we'll begin to see it in our life. That's how good God is. So, let's see. What we gained, let me see. Oh, we're back. We retained that. Okay. I could go on and on. (laughs) Hallelujah. See, God has a glorious plan for your life. He does. And, And the key to living in the superabundance of grace and the gift of our righteousness is to learn more and more. Ephesians 4.22, here's what we have to do. It says 4.22 through 24. In order to live this victorious life, we need to put off our old man, put off our old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. You know, that's the old man. That's not you. It's not you. Put that off and be renewed in the spirit of your minds. That's learn the word. Learn what God says about you. Learn who God says you are. And put on the new self. The new self, 
created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. The new you has been created in true righteousness and holiness. See, there's a false righteousness out there, and that's what a lot of religions want us to do. They want us to just clean, you clean up your act, you know. You get yourself looking nice and clean, you do lots of good stuff, you know. You act, you reform the old man, and that's righteousness, but it's not. The righteousness that God accepts is his own righteousness, which comes to us as that free gift when we believe in Jesus Christ. That's true righteousness. That's true holiness. It's a gift from God through Jesus Christ. So, our thought patterns can be shaped by the past or our thought patterns can be shaped by the new man. And it's our choice. It's our choice who we're going to listen to. Are we going to listen to the old man? <laughs> no. <laughs> it's a bad idea. Yeah. Are we going to listen to the new man? Yes. Yeah. He'll guide us into righteousness. Mm -hmm. Romans 12:2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. See, you can tell the things that are of the old man. And you can tell the things that are of God. And God has given us peace as the umpire. When you're faced with a choice, follow peace. If you're faced with a choice and you don't know, well, is this good or is this bad, follow peace. Because God has given us an umpire in our soul, the Holy Spirit, to guide us into righteousness. Follow peace. Hallelujah. Glory to you, God. So, what's the crux of all this? I want you to know, on the cross, you died. And the old man is never coming back. <laughs> and in Christ, you have risen into new life. New life. And God wants us to live that life to the fullest. Hallelujah. In Christ, you have been resurrected. You have received his Holy Spirit. He has given us everything we need pertaining to life and godliness. And he promises to walk with us every day. Do not let your life be guided by circumstances. Good circumstances or bad circumstances. Circumstances are going to change. Circumstances are temporal. Today you're up, tomorrow you're down. But you know what? Your spirit is always up. And you can always encourage yourself in the love of Christ. Because nothing... Not your past, not your present, not your future. Nothing can separate you from the love of God, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ is our past. And it's a glorious past where we've received his spirit. He's our present. And it's a glorious present. Because we've received his spirit. And it's a future that we cannot even begin to imagine. Because it's so glorious. 
Hallelujah. So God just wants to say to you, welcome to your glorious story. This is your story. It's his story. It's his story in you. God continues to write history in your life. God continues to live big in your life. Jesus Christ is experiencing your life with you. So call on him. He wants you to know that he is experiencing life with you. And he wants it to be exciting. And he wants it to be fun. And he wants you to be filled with his joy and his excitement and his anticipation because we have not yet begun to see what is in store as the sons of God take their place. But it's beginning because we know his love. It's beginning. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you have given us a past, (laughs) a glorious past. And I thank you, Father, that you are here in our present and you have designed our future and you will guide us to it and through it and we'll live with you forever. (laughs) Thank you, Father, for this word, this encouragement, this new life we have in Christ. Father, we thank you for the food that has been prepared for us. Father, bless the fellowship at each table. And Father, help us to remember this week as we go forth just how much you love us. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah.